Uh, thank you, Jean, for the introduction. So this is work I did with Casper uh, Honbeck back in 2014-15 the University of Copenhagen during my uh, postdocs. Um, and okay, so Mintergest and Posture session, and we're probably all aware that with the diverse screen technologies uh, that are available today, we can expect that different devices afford different postures while they're being used. Um, and while some of those postures might simply be bad for your back, research from social psychology claims that uh, certain postures might also affect uh, your behavior. For example, they might uh, make you take more risks than you would take otherwise. Uh, such claims can be traced back to uh, a paper on power posing by uh, Dana Carney, Amy Cuddy, and Andy Yap, which they published back in 2010, and which states that if someone holds an expensive posture for one or two minutes, then that person will feel more powerful, reflected in changes of hormone levels, and an increased likelihood to take risks. Um, the concept of power poses has been popularized, especially by uh, Amy Cuddy through her 2012 TED talk. And in this talk, which has been seen now by almost 50 million people, she tells the audience to uh, take on a pose similar to hers here um, and promises them that they will feel more powerful after doing so. So the poses that they uh, use in the experiment are shown here with the high power poses on the top and the low, low power poses on the bottom. Uh, participants were explicitly instructed to take on these postures. And the researchers measured their hormone levels before and after they did so. And they asked participants whether they were willing to take a gamble. So this work might not seem directly relevant to HCI, but this article has actually been cited uh, at least 29 times by articles from the HCI literature. Uh, most of these articles are on uh, whole body or gesture interaction. Uh, and some of them are more on uh, gaming interfaces. But only a few are very directly inspired by and built on power poses. So over the last few years, it turned out that the evidence for power poses is actually a bit weak. So it started with a first replication attempt, which was published in 2015, which uh, failed to confirm the claims uh, of the Carney article, particularly the claims related to hormone changes and risk taking. So in reply to this, Carney, Caddy, and Yap, uh, published a review of 33 articles um, where they attempt to identify reasons for why the replication attempt by Rainhill and colleagues had failed. Uh, meanwhile, statisticians such as Andrew Gellman and Kaiser Fung argued in blogs and online magazines that it is more likely that the original results were simply due to a st statistical fluke, since the original study was uh, much lower powered than the, the failed replication. And surprisingly, in 2016, Dana Carney, who's the first author on the 2010 paper, uh, published a statement on her personal website where she explains that she herself doesn't believe anymore that power poses, power pose effects are real. Uh, she admits to having used questionable research practices, and she writes that she was a reviewer on uh, many failed replications and that the evidence against power poses now seems undeniable to her. little problem with my slides. <laughs> um, roughly around the same time, a journal focusing uh, specifically on pre-registered studies announced a special issue to determine definitively whether there actually is a power pose effect or not. Um, they eventually published an issue which contained uh, eight articles. Seven of those are replication attempts, and the eighth is a meta-analysis. Um, and the meta-analysis focuses specifically on a self-reported uh, felt power measure. So to summarize uh, their results, none of the articles found evidence for any behavioral effects such as uh, risk taking. Um, and for the felt power measure, six studies included it, only one had results significant at the 5% level. And the meta-analysis concluded that there was combined evidence for a small effect of felt power. However, personally, I would say the practical relevance remains uh, rather low as one would need uh, to run studies with about 900 participants for a 95% chance to actually identify this effect. Okay, so in summary, explicit power poses where people are asked to take on a certain pose are probably not that relevant for us. 
But explicit power poses are not really relevant for HCI anyways, as we don't really want to ask our users to take on a funny pose before they use our system. So the more relevant, for, relevant work for us is a less known article from 2013, where they studied incidental power poses and their effect on stealing, cheating, and traffic violations. So this article is a lot less known. Uh, it asserts to not having used questionable research practices. And it is much more relevant to HCI. Okay, so what are incidental power poses? Uh, in the older article, an experimenter had to explicitly instruct participants to take on a certain posture and to hold it for a while. So incidental power poses are a lot less controlled. Here, participants are simply put into an environment whose design indirectly imposes postures. So for example, here on the left, a large workspace requires reaching and incidentally leads to open postures. On the right, a large car seat leads to stretched out arms and legs uh, in a driving simulator, whereas a narrow seat leads to a more closed posture. Okay, so if incidental power poses, postures have uh, indeed uh, an effect on people's cheating and risk-taking behavior, then that should be very much relevant to HCI, as uh, the right variety of screen technologies available and studied today lead to uh, a large set of different uh, incidental postures when used, and user interface layouts are relevant in situations where people need to make decisions. So we thought, should there be an effect of uh, incidental postures, then interface designers would need to be aware of it. And so we started thinking how uh, we could study an incidental power pose effect in an HCI context. A first step was to uh, identify scenarios in which we could easily manipulate incidental postures just through the UI design while keeping everything else constant across conditions. Uh, we landed on touch interaction, on wall size displays, and on tabletop displays. So we designed the first experiment with a wall display. With this experiment, we wanted to test whether there really is a large effect as uh, the original papers had promised. Um, we simply asked 40 people to uh, tap targets on a wall display for 90 seconds. Half of the participants uh, had to tap targets leading to a rather constrictive posture, whereas uh, the other half was tapping in a more expensive posture. Afterwards, we gave them a short questionnaire, including uh, the two self-report measures from the Carney article, and asking them about their level of comfort, all uh, on a seven-point scale. So here we see a histogram of the responses for the first question uh, about feeling powerful and 95% uh, bootstrapped confidence intervals for the respective means. As you can see, they are slightly offset. And uh, if we look at an estimate of the difference between them, we find that the uncertainty around the estimate is too high to conclude that there was an effect of posture. Um, for the second measure, feeling in charge, we found overall no evidence suggesting an effect in either direction. Most importantly, though, we found a high level of discomfort experienced by participants only in the expense of posture. So this clearly in indicates that comfort confounded with the uh, posture type. So to sum up experiment one, we found no conclusive effect for felt power. We can at best say that the point estimate is in the predicted direction. For the feeling in charge measure, we could not even detect the direction. So it was really centered on zero. Um, posture had, however, a very large effect on discomfort. So in summary, we could find no conclusive evidence for power pose effect, but this might have been due to a confound between posture and discomfort. So to come back to the motivating question of this article, the relevance of incidental power pose remains unclear. But we still don't know if comfort as a confound masked a potential effect. And finally, if an effect was masked, then um, are there behavioral effects such as increased risk taking? So to find out, we designed a second experiment where we addressed the discomfort issue by using a tabletop display at which participants were sitting and where they could rest their arms on the surface similarly for both uh, postures. Then we measured uh, behavior through the BART, the Balloon Analog Risk Task, which is a, a standard test uh, from psychology. It involves playing a game to pump up balloons, which may explode at any moment. Um, and pumping is incentivized through a higher payout but it is also risky, as exploded balloons don't give any points. We ran a total of 80 participants this time in a between-study design, so 40 per condition. And besides the BART, we also gave them a questionnaire to measure their base level of impulsivity. 
the dependent measure is a percent change over the course of the task. So the basic idea here is that if the incidental power pulse had an effect, then it should happen between the beginning and the end of the task. So for example, here we see the behavior for one participant for all 30 balloons. Um, the points in red are the balloons that exploded. And for the ones that didn't explode, the black ones, we compute the average amount of pumps for each group of 10 balloons. Then we compute percent change as the difference between the, the last phase and the first phase relative to the first phase. So for our example here, we get an 85% increase over the course of the task. So for this experiment, we analyzed our data using a Bayesian data analysis with a robust heteroscedastic linear model and weekly informed skeptical price. You can find all the details in the paper. If you're not familiar with Bayesian analysis, uh, what you need to know here is that uh, our analysis is basically a Bayesian analog to an ANOVA, except that there are no assumptions of normality or equivariances uh, between groups. So the outcome of a Bayesian analysis is a probability density function, which is shown in blue here. It indicates the range of uh, credible values for the respective means of the two postures in this example. The error bar inside indicates the 95% highest density inter interval, which means that all values within this interval have a higher credibility than all values outside it. The thicker the blue area, the more credible a value is. Um, as you can see here, the results look very similar for the two postures. And we, if we compute the difference, which is shown here on the right now, it is clearly centered around zero, with no indication of an effect in either direction. So as I said before, we also measure people's uh, base level of imp impuls impulsiveness. And uh, we ran exploratory analysis, an analog to a two-factor ano ANOVA. But we also looked at how people's impulsivity scores interacted with their behavior. And if we look at the parameters of this linear model, we find again no indication of an effect for power posture in either direction. Um, impulsiveness led to a slight offset between high and low scores. And somewhat surprisingly, we found that there might be an interaction. People who score low on the impulsiveness scale seem to be more likely to take risks when in an expensive posture, while for people who are high on the scale, the effect is reversed. However, this part of the analysis was pu purely exploratory, and uh, such an interaction would need to be confirmed through a replication uh, before any claims of uh, an actual interaction could be made. So let's come back to the motivating question of the article. Uh, how relevant are incidental power poses for HCI? The second experiment found no evidence for a posture effect in either direction, although the remaining uncertainty could mask a rather small effect. Based on our findings, we would not recommend trying to influence people's behavior through incidental postures. We think that at best it would lead to a very small effects and at worst, users might experience considerable uh, discomfort due to such postures. But an open question remains, which is whether there's indeed an interaction with personality traits, such as uh, impulsivity. Um, but answering this question would require a high-powered replication. So at this point, I'd like to step back a bit and conclude by emphasizing the need uh, for replication culture in uh, HCI. So Kai still focuses strongly on original research. Uh, even though there, there was a Replicai initiative a few years back that tried to, to uh, open the community to uh, be more receptive for replication work. Um, but uh, yeah, something this project has uh, taught me is that sometimes we need to check the assumption on which we build our research. And uh, I want to finish by arguing that we as a community should think about uh, incentives for replications in HCI and maybe rethink our publication outlets as other communities have already done, for example, in psychology. So first step could be, for example, uh, special issues of uh, journals that will only accept pre-registered studies or even registered re reports, which um, are a new format of uh, publications which are actually reviewed before any data are collected and are simply um, judged based on the interestingness of the research question. Um, so finally, if anyone wants to replicate our work, you can find the material on uh, this website. 
And if anything is still missing, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alexandra Ayan from Hasse Plattner Institute. Um, I'm really impressed by this work. I really like also this call out. Thanks for that. It's great. And although you didn't find um, uh, effects, so I was wondering, um, could there may be maybe something like a more long-term effect that if you ask people if you uh, if they feel more empowered, like at that moment, maybe I don't know. I, I'm just wondering, like maybe you don't realize that you feel more uh, empowered, if that makes sense, you know what I mean? You mean uh, for self-report measures, how people do feel? Or the more like that maybe you cannot tell, like, you know, some things are just very subliminal, so, and if you would have these um, UIs that, that kind of induce these, these poses over a long time, maybe over several months or a year or so, that you would you know, it's hard to trace back to those UIs, of course, but, but yeah. uh, you know, I'm just wondering if that could be like a long-term effect or, you know, whatever I your experience no with that. What? Maybe. The, the question is how would you be able to measure it, right? Exactly. It's very hard to measure, but uh, I don't know. I think it's a nice thought to uh, um, yeah, try to change people again. Well, it's like, you know, behavior change with software. And I, I'm just, I don't know. I was just very inspired by this work. It's really cool. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Yvonne. Uh, Michel baudon lafont from uh, Paris Sud. Um, well, this is very fascinating work, I think. Thank you. Uh, and I want to thank you also for the call to replication. There are a few sessions I saw that uh, starting to do this, so hopefully the, the wind is turning on, on uh, doing more, uh, I guess, proper scientific research in HCI. The question I had about, about the topic is that the experiments, both those you shown in the historical perspective and, and the ones you run, had a single person doing a task and you were measuring the effect of the power poses on, on that person's uh, perception. Mm -hmm. uh, what about if you had, say, two or several people and do power poses uh, have an effect on the other people and does this effect then could reflect on me? So. Uh, something you did not see in a single user uh, type of setup uh, could be different in, in a sort of social context. Yeah, this is a hypothesis that was actually studied by, I think, Joseph Cesario uh, in 2017, I think. And he uh, studied diets, so dyadic interaction. And I think he did not, he had pairs where one person uh, had the posture before interacting with the other person. The other person was not aware, I think, and he also found nothing. Okay. So he, okay. well, he, so he now also says Thank that uh, <laughs> even social situations should not uh, change anything. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yes. Thank you. Just a quick question. Thank you very much for this work. Very, very interesting. And um, I'm Nadia Bertus from uh, uh, the University College London. I just wonder uh, if you have looked into f uh, factors such as uh, ability to, uh, or the difference between people that tend to pay really attention to their body. They talk in, in psychology, especially in VR, or study on uh, perception of yourself and how you can adapt and change the perception of, uh, of your body and, and so on. They look at, uh, they, they see an effect of, uh, of uh, these two kind of, so not personality traits, but this different of people that have a much more inward attention, so they are able to tell you their number of bits <laughs> per meter versus people that are more attentive to the outside world. In, and in, in VR type study, they see that the, the, the second, the one that, that pay more attention to the outside world are more susceptible to this, uh, uh, to, uh, to their brain be tricked to perceive a different body or, and I wonder if here could be the opposite, that people that are much more attentive to themselves and maybe more affected by this kind of a, uh, mm -hmm. That's an interesting uh, possibility. I have no idea. I don't, I don't remember coming across any research looking into that, but uh, that could definitely be interesting. Because I thought concern. it may be more interesting than personality in general, because you say yeah. it would be so difficult to explore, but yeah. this attention to in your body to or the outside. 
Yeah, yeah. definitely. Okay. But anyway, that, that's worked great. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.